Well, thanks for joining in today uh, for another session of the Law Lounge. Today we're uh, diving into the dark arts of scrums. Um, again, just a, a few things. We'll go through presentation first, and uh, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat, um, and then we can, uh, if I haven't covered them off, we can have a bit of a chat about them at the end, and then we'll take some, uh, take some live uh, questions as well and discussion around um, anything and everything to do with scrums. So. Um, all right, get underway. So again, where we pull our resources from. Uh, so our, our laws of the game obviously dictate uh, what we do within the game. So a great resource there. Uh, we have quite a lot of variations to do with the Scrum within our domestic safety law variations. Uh, and as well as our, on our Bad Penny Rugby website, uh, you can access all of the above, plus a lot of education materials and our intro to refer rugby refereeing uh, course and workbook as well. So just looking at uh, what scrums are for really, um, it's to restart play uh, following a minor infringement or a stoppage. Um, basically, if in doubt, have a scrum uh, is a, uh, is a <laughs> good rule of thumb for a referee. Uh, so definition of a scrum is a set piece, consi normally consists of eight players and they're bound to get in formation and we'll go over in detail what that formation looks like today. Um, just talking about binding definition, uh, so that's actually grasping at another player's body firmly. Um, so we often use the word strong as well uh, when it comes to firmly. Um, between the shoulders and hips with the whole arm. Uh, and the whole arm being hand to shoulder. Uh, so not just dangling on with your fingers. And talking about uncontested scrums, we don't cover them too much. However, we do mention them a couple of times within uh, the scrum law. Um, it is a scrum in which the throwing team gains position. Uh, it's still the same formation, it's eight on eight. Um, no team can push off the mark. Again, it's not, uh, there, there are some variations when it comes to things like golden oldies and whatever it might be. Uh, you know, but other, other than the fact that you can't push and the team throwing in wins possession, uh, all other scrum laws apply. Uh, I tried to condense and summarize where and who um, for scrums, however, I really couldn't get it better than what the actual law website itself um, outlines in its table. So I'm actually going to link straight to that in this in this presentation. So if you jump into our law website, and we, we come into where we have our scrum. So uh, after a knock on and throw forward, um, again, a bit of a summary, I guess, for all scrums is that all scrums are in the scrum zone. So our scrum zone consists of everything that's within uh, five meters from the, uh, the touch lines or the goal lines. Um, so no scrum can be held within five meters of those lines, and that's that's referring to the mark of the the mark of the scrum, not not the participants within it. Uh, so after after a knock on a throw forward, it's at the place closest to the infringement, uh, and the team who didn't do that throws in the ball. Um, but if it's at a line out with that same infringement at a line out. Um, or a line out infringement and create quick throw or those options taken, then the, the non-offending team uh, feeds that scrum and that is, the mark for that is 15 metres away from on the mark of touch. Uh, 15 metres from touch, I should say. Um, if there's a scrum option taken for an offside uh, or a penalty, uh, sorry, an offside penalty, uh, then closest to where the offending team last played the ball. Um, or if there's two players, then it's the nearest player to the uh, to the ball carrier. Um, sorry, that's a penalty mark, I should say. Um, the for a scrum option for a penalty, a free kick. So where the team just chooses to take a scrum, it's at the at the place of the penalty or free kick within the scrum zone. Um, for a ball that's taken in goal by the defending team and made dead, um, then the scrum is out in the scrum zone closest to where the ball was made dead. Again, can't be within five meters of that goal line or that touch line, and the attacking team throws in the ball. That's that's key that that ball has to be taken in to the end goal by the defending team. And it's uh, we didn't dive into too much with an now end goal uh, chat, um, but if thinking about a charge down, and this is a particular one that I've seen even professional referees get, get wrong, um, if, you, if, if things get confusing and you think, oh, all right, there's a lot going on, there's a kick and there's a charge down, just think, how how did the ball get from the field of play 
back into the end goal? Was it passed in by the by the defending by the defending team, or uh, was it um, was a kick from outside of, in, in, within the field of play? The charge down happened, and then it was actually put into the end goal by the attacking team after from the charge down. So really, just think: how did that ball cross the line? Who put it there? And then make a decision off that, and then it becomes quite quite simple. Um, so if you have an unplayable uh, ball in a tackle or ruck, uh, this is a this is always a, a good one. Um, and same with the more being successfully, I'll talk about that shortly. But uh, obviously, the point is where it's got closest to where the tackle or ruck took place. You know, the person, the team that puts the ball into the into that scrum is the last team moving forward. Um, if neither team was moving forward, this is where we need to really be clear on our definitions. Uh, it's the attacking team. Now, the attacking team does not necessarily mean to mean the team in possession of the ball. Um, by the definition of law, the attacking team is the team in which um, is, a, is a team in which is uh, closest to the opposition goal line. So, if if the play is in your half, you're the defending team, uh, and if you are in the opposition's half, you are the attacking team. So if neither team was moving forward, it went straight down, and it's unplayable, the attacking team gets it. And it's just tough luck if, if the uh, defending team was in position prior to that. Uh, with a maul, slightly different. Um, so within a, uh, a normal maul and setup in general play, um, the team not in position at the start of the maul um, then gets the feed into that scrum. So if Red, Red took it into the maul uh, and the maul collapses without uh, without infringement, um, then and it's unplayable. You know, the ball can't be played immediately. Um, then we have uh, we have a scrum to blue or whatever the opposition is. Uh, if the referee can't decide who actually had position going into that maul, then again we revert, we revert back to our um, unplayable tackle and ruck. Uh, then it's team in position prior to the maul stopping. And if neither team, was move, uh, neither team was moving forward, then it's the attacking team that gets it. Yep. So if you're un unclear on it, just always go back to your unplayable law, and then that helps you out. Uh, slightly different from more from a from a kick in open play. So if that occurs, uh, we have um, a scrum to the team. Uh, if that maul forms straight away, so contact's made on that player who just received that kick. Maul forms uh, straight away from from that from that ensuing contact, uh, then the team in possession uh, at the start of the mall. So uh, if that receiving player had key possession, then they get they get that uh, they get that feed into the scrum uh, if that mall goes down. It, you know, without being illegal that is. So incorrect kickoff or restart kick. Um, we did cover this a bit within uh, restarts, but the actual scrum position uh, is at the middle point of the halfway line uh, or 22 meter line uh, if the restart uh, was if, if it was a 22 meter dropout um, and it's the long picking team that uh, that feeds that that scrum uh, if the referee asks someone to use it uh, any phase of the uh, in any phase of play uh, and they don't use it then there is a uh, scrum to the opposition um, closest to where that ruck or rum scrum, uh, scrum ruck or more took place um ball or ball carrier touches the referee and the key thing is here is that either team gains an advantage and the second key part is that it's the ball or the ball carrier it has nothing to do with the opposition so if there's a non-ball carrier that touches the referee it's just tough luck uh which was very well documented in an all Blacks game a few a few years ago um so that that scrum is in the scrum zone close to the incident and the team that last played the ball puts into that puts into the scrum so even if it's a if it's a kick, and that kick hits the referee, the team that last kicked it, that last played the ball, that made that kick, uh, puts into the scrum at the place where the incident occurred. So even if you're a referee that's five minutes upfield, um, yeah, that's where it hits you. That's where you put the scrum. Stoppage due to injury, just the team last in possession. That's where we restart where the ball was last played. Uh, if there's a reset scrum after no infringement. And the scrum goes back to the original place, and this is this is a, there's a point of difference for this in DSLV law, which to be to be perfectly honest um, baffles me why, but it is uh, DSLV law states that if it's uh, um, if there's a wheeled scrum 
and it moves upfield, then and uh, and, it, and there's no infringement. Uh, then the scrum mark actually becomes where the where the scrum stopped. So even if it travels a meter upfield at an under 16s game, and then collapses uh, wheels or wheels past the 45, uh, then we have a scrum at the new mark. However, for the rest of rugby, we don't. It goes back to the original mark and the original team throws in the ball. Uh, penalty attempt. Um, so not taken with a time limit. Again, it's closer to where the penalty mark was. Non-offending team, so the opposition gets the ball. Uh, if the player can't take a free kick uh, within a minute, then you have to have a scrum. You, uh, no one else can take a free kick. So the team awarded the free kick gets to have that scrum. And if the referee just decides to award a uh, scrum for anything else, then it's just that the place closest to the stoppage and the team last moving forward gets the ball. And if neither team was moving forward, then the attacking team gets the ball. So when in doubt, there's always some kind of way to stop and restart a game. And that's covered by um, having a scrum with the team moving forward. And if neither team is moving forward, the attacking team gets it. So when in doubt, you've got an out, uh, so to speak. But hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Okay, let's roll on back to this. Okay, so now that we've covered the where and the who. Okay, so setting up a scrum. So number one thing is safety. Safety is absolute key. And of course, in all aspects of rugby, however, scrum is a particular hot spot for where we absolutely need, um, of, you know, scrum set up is, in place for a reason and there are particular reasons why uh, we do things the way we do and that's so that we can minimize the risk of serious injury uh, and it is the referee's job which is why we go through rugby smart as referees um, or part of the reason why we go through rugby smart as referees to ensure that we can play our part in minimizing the risk of serious injury because we're the ones with the whistle who can stop play uh, so referees make a mark uh, scrum is formed at that mark and eight players from each team are required to form a scrum. We're talking 15s rugby here by default. Um, again, within the scrum zone, no closer than five meters from the touchline or goal line. Uh, just a note on making the mark, uh, referee is required to make a half mark. So that's a point in the ground. Um, a lot of referees will make that uh, up and down. So towards each goal line, first of all, uh, and then they're actually required to make a second mark as well. And that, that the mark they're required to make is uh, supposed to go east-west, uh, and that's from uh, so parallel to the goal lines, um, you know, from touchline to touchline, and that's to create a bit of a centre line, uh, so that you have a a gauge for the front rows um, when they're lining up and for something for them to look at. Scrum formation. Uh, so setting up one arm length apart, and this is by law. Uh, so Feet of the front row is shoulder width apart, uh, feet, shoulders, and hips square. Uh, props and hook are firmly bound, and we talked about binding and what that looks like before. Uh, shoulders of the front row players at or above hip height, and that's a, you know, that's a key part that they have to maintain that for the duration of the scrum as well. Uh, we're looking for the locks to bind tightly and then bind onto the front row, and then the loose forwards bind with the number eight binding between the locks. And I'll just reiterate that last part that the number eight does actually bind between the locks and that is written in law uh, so just be mindful of number eight to uh, try to change channels um, and bind in between um, the lock and the flank uh, sorry the um, a lock and a flanker that is not permitted within law uh, and all spines in line so in line meaning parallel to the touch lines and um, pointing towards uh, the goal, opposition goal line. So engagement sequence, the, the referee in a nutshell looks to do when they're engaging the, the teams. So they must be satisfied with the formation as, as uh, mentioned above. Uh, first call is crouch. Look for balance and stability at that call. The so front rows have their heads to the left of the immediate opponent. Uh, no heads touching the neck or shoulders. Again, you've made that, you've made that central mark. If uh, quite, it's quite a simple way to do that to make sure that all the heads are to the left is that you ask the hooker to line up left to that mark. And if, everyone, if both hookers line up left to that mark, then all heads are going to go left of the opposite and there shouldn't be too much confusion. 
Uh, again, no heads touching the neck or shoulders of the opposition. At this point in crouch, all the balance, all the, uh, all the stability is on its own team. So they are the ones holding themselves up. There is no reliance on the opposition. So there shouldn't be any touching of them right at this point. Bind is the next call. So once we're happy with the crouch that they've met those obligations, we bind and we look for balance and stability. So again, they get the binding sorted. They are still responsible for their own uh, balance and stability at this point. And then set is our third call again once we once we are satisfied with uh, that that bind. So players then get into a position to be ready and push forward and front rows have feet on the ground, weight firmly on at least one foot. Uh, hook his feet in line with or behind the foremost foot of that team's prop of that of that team's props. So that's uh that's one thing just to have a look through the tunnel. Um the hooker's feet can't be uh can't be behind um oh, sorry can't be in front of their, their props feet. So if it is then something's happening either um the hooker's feet are too far forward and they're just they've got they're just waiting for uh they're not really supporting their weight they're just sort of maybe swinging a bit and they're not really holding that holding it up or the or the props feet are too or too far back and uh they are relying completely on the opposition to hold themselves up uh and not um and they're putting themselves at danger of collapsing um so if they're setting up incorrectly with those feet or, or hanging those feet out in front too far that's where we can put our free kick in and uh, get on with it. The ball can only be thrown in once all of the above has been met. Scrum is set, balanced and stable. Have a little, we'll have a look at this clip. Crouch! Oh. Bind! Up, up, not this, up. Run. Just no, 16. So we haven't had a bind call, uh, we haven't had a set call yet, we've only had bind. So we are still needing a gap at this point and we're only focusing on binding. As you can see, far side, blue. Engaging, yes, you see all the blue players. It's quite obvious this one. Moving forward, right there. And we're only at bind. So that's a pretty uh, easy free kick for the referee to blow. We come back to law. There was no sound on that one, Cam. There was no sound? Okay. No. Cool. But that's right. Yeah, oh, hopefully, my explanation know. actually worked enough on that one. Yeah, all good. Okay, cool. Thanks for, thanks for that one, Brenda. Just, uh, get it back to Sorry, guys, I'm just going to pause. Cool. So, just looking at law for. That infringement. So throughout the crouch and bind, players then do need to completely hold their weight. No heads touching neck or shoulders. Um, there was no set call from the referee. Blue came in um, prior to that set call and made contact with, with green. You can actually see the entire um, pack moving forward, but particularly the front rows did. Um, can be often be referred to as a pre-engagement and sanctioned the free kick. Uh, and it's a, it's a free kick any day and one that is best managed quite early uh, in the game. Binding. So we talked a bit about before about how a bind does happen, and that's with the whole arm from hand to shoulder. Uh, so front row, they must be tenuously bound throughout the duration of the scrum, um, and firmly as well. That's onto their own players, but, but particularly the opposition. Um, Non-front row players, again, must bind on to the up lock of their team with one arm. Uh, so if you if we can look at the diagram on the right hand side there, uh, we can see that every single player who's not a front rower has uh, an arm around a lock. So even the locks have a, an arm around, uh, binding by definition around another lock. The locks really are the key um, to to the binding, and that will that's an easy one to police. Then you have that in your mind uh, for flankers who start getting a bit too close up and around towards the opposition. If they are binding properly around their lock, 
then they, there's no way they should ever be able to reach a front rower or uh, an opposition flanker um, because that would require their arm to come out away from their lock or for them to be bound onto their prop, um, which, is, which are both illegal binds. Uh, number eight, again, must be bound between the locks at the back there, as we can see, not in either of the other two channels. Sanction for any, any binding infringements at any point uh, is a penalty. So just what binding looks like uh, from the side. So again, legal binding, um, looking at the loose heads um, and up inside the tight head. Uh, so tight heads arm, so bound to the tight head side or back. Again, side or back is pretty key. Uh, so at least if you're starting the um, back is preferable uh, if they can reach up there, because at least if they're no slipping down, then they're going to end up on the side. Uh, tight head's arm is up the, on the outside of the opponent's arm and bound to his side or back. Uh, so we can kind of see the two arms interlocked there uh, and good strong positions, nice and high sort of on the upper upper side. Nice flat back too. Look at that. You can put a put a broom across the top. Again, uh, all binding sanctions are penalties at any stage of a scrum. Uh, what we're looking out for is referees. So when we're identifying problems, um, obviously the mismatch front rows. Um, this is particularly for uh, games, uh, this is for any level, but particularly for age, age grade games. Um, we have different heights, sizes, weights, etc. Um, looking out for chins on chest, uh, shoulders below hips, players standing up, and players being pushed up. So again, not all of these are necessarily things that you that, that referees can and will sanction all the time. Uh, obviously, players standing up or things like shoulders below hips are things that um, are pretty basics that we that referees can sanction. However, these are problems that we that as referees we can identify and then work with the players to try and remedy in, in some way. So it might be a conversation for starters or um, at some point, you know, if there's new players on the field. Um, again, ultimately, um, safety is paramount. So, if if these are if these are happening, um, like when I say mismatch front rows, um, we're talking about also also the I guess the strength of a of a front row, and if they're getting completely uh, dominated, um, or if it's looking dangerous in in fact of their mismatch, then it's a it's a duty as a referee to stop to stop the game, blow the whistle and stop. Because again, that power with the whistle has, has, it has the power to prevent serious, serious injury. And um, it doesn't matter if a team is dominating and they are winning that facet of the game. If the player's getting injured, then there's, what's the point of turning out there and playing rugby? So scrum management, uh, again, this relates to our safety as well. So, and, and also the legal setup of the scrum. So just when we're managing our scrums, making sure that we're balanced and not pushing early. Uh, the scrum fee is not delayed because that can have impact on um, on those front rows and, 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 what, and what they're doing and how long they can hold things for in particular. Uh, then we've got straight towards opposition goal line and parallel to the ground when they're pushing. Uh, that we're mindful of any age grade uh, laws, DSLVs, um, and they're being, they're being adhered to where applicable. And where and that the participants, all participants are remaining bound to the ball emerges. Again, reiterate safety is paramount. So ensure that any calls that are made are made with safety in mind at the very first instance. If they if scrums are continuously looking unsafe, or you feel as, or as a referee, they, the referee feels that they cannot continue safely, uh, then uncontested scrums must be applied. Um, irrespective of whether one's team one team is dominant or not, um, safety again is paramount. So uncontested scrums, that decision lies with the referee and the referee alone. In saying that, it's not a referee's duty to to assess whether a player is suitably trained for the front row. However, if, whether they're suitably trained or not, it's if things are looking dangerous. Um, once those scrums can, uh, once those scrums carry on, um, then that's when we go to uncontested scrums.
or if the team says no we don't have anyone trained or no we think this is going to be dangerous we actually are we're not confident that we can get out of this dangerously so safely then uncontested scrums and depending on the competition rules or what the setup is that's when you'd file a uh, referee would file a match report just so that there's a uh, the, the organizers are made aware that yep um we had we went to uncontested scrums because xyz um when you know but again that's uh not a not a usual thing and really most often applies to age grade uh, or social rugby pre-match briefing so most com this is not in law however it is in most competition rules uh, so most competitions do require teams to make themselves available to the referee for a pre-match briefing um, so just a few basics again every referee will have their what they're focusing on or just a couple of key things um, but as a starter just some of the basics that should be outlined for the scrum uh, if you're going to outline anything uh, so you've got to make sure you have all the front row play players there it's preferable to have the halfbacks um, this is probably less so now considering that we have uh, that we're not asking the the, the scrum uh, the halfback to, to put the ball in however they need to know what stability looks like and when it when it is set so again um, it is preferable to have the halfback there so they have a good understanding of 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 what you are talking to about talking to the front rows about uh, Chick who's previously played in the front row, particularly um, particularly mindful of this for uh, age grade rugby, just so you have a good idea of their experience and can then perhaps as a referee manage that uh, or watch those um, players particularly just to ensure that things are remaining safe. Uh, referee, uh, just talk about the mark and for hookers to line up um, to the left. Uh, again, make sure that they're arms distance as well, so not lining up too close or too far away. Uh, and just go through what you expect on uh, referees, go through what they expect on their, each of their calls. So again, as I re reiterated before, um, for each, each of those crouch and those bind calls, uh, for each of those calls, that then the balance relies completely on, the, on each team individually. They are balancing themselves, they're, they're, they're responsible for their own stability. Uh, and we have gap. We have a gap between uh, the front rows, so no heads resting on shoulders and in um, on the opposition. And that, and that ensures that stability. Again, set is where the teams come together. Uh, balance becomes the responsibility of both teams. That before that ball's put in, the, the teams work together to ensure that scrum is held up. So that's a go-to line that I use: is that hey, work with the opposition because. There's no, we're not going. We can't start a scrum until we have um, until we have that the scrum nice and nice and stable. Uh, it, the law does say no movement. Uh, in reality, that is impractical. There is always going to be a little bit of movement, but you shouldn't. There shouldn't be a lot of jostling or twisting or moving around. But there's always going to be a little bit of movement. So that's why we use stability as a as a better word. Uh, scrum half getting the ball into the scrum so the throw so they can feed from either side and um, they usually throw from their loose head side um, and holding the ball is shown in the diagrams down there uh, so they so once the side to square stable and stationary again that word stationary um, so long as they are balanced and not there isn't a whole lot of movement uh, the scrum uh, the halfback throws the ball in so they throw the ball in from outside the tunnel without delay uh, it's a single forward motion at quick speed uh, and it's got to be straight so they can actually line up as, in, as they have in the diagram at the bottom you can see the yellow scrum half is lined up with their shoulder at the middle line of the scrum so they're actually closer to their side of the scrum however the ball still has to go in straight so they still they can't feed it back on an angle towards the back of their scrum they have to feed it then if they feed it straight that means that one that one tip of the ball really is going down that middle mark of the of the of the scrum there so um no matter where they stand they uh they have to um they have to feed the ball straight if they decide to stand so lining their shoulder on the middle line of the scrum um if they choose to go the other way it it really does them no favors because they still have to feed the ball straight uh so they can't feed the ball diagonally across the scrum uh because the uh, the wording used to be that it had to pass through the middle mark uh, the, the mark of the scrum 
that's no longer the case. They do have to feed the ball dead straight. Um, and again, it's a management thing, a conversation to have with a, with the halfback if that ball's looking a bit wonky, perhaps a conversation to have prior to the next scrum. If they're continuing to do it, then that's where we can take action um, as referees. So uh, the ball's got to touch the ground inside the tunnel. And again, if it, if it doesn't do any of those things or if there's any infringements around those, those are all free kick infringements. Um, and then once the ball's left his hands, scrum begins. So the second it's out of those hands, then the scrum has started. Key learning for our law exam for any referees out there. During the scrum, so once that scrum's underway, so ball's left the hands, um, the idea is that possession's gained um, by pushing the opposition off the ball. Um, again, backwards, because the, the only way that you are pushing an opposition is back towards their goal line. You can't push them sideways. Um, so that's, uh, that's key, that one there. Um, other ways of gaining possession, of course, you can hook the ball. So I'll talk about hooking and striking for the ball shortly. Um, the duties of the referee, so if there's a collapse, um, players are forced upwards out of the scrum, the referee's got to blow the whistle immediately so that players stop pushing. Again, that's by law, a practical uh, demonstration of that would look like if that ball is back at the back of the scrum, it's available, the front rows are down in the safe positions, uh, you would ask, you'd ask the team to use, if, if, if there's been no clear infringement and uh, you'd ask the team to use it and get it out of there. Um, rather than if, if, if things are safe. Again, safety is the number one thing. So if any, mind, if any decision that is made, have safety. Number one is the first go-to in your mind. Does it look unsafe? Yes, blow the whistle. Then decide what you call it. Uh, teams may push once the scrum begins. Again, once that ball leaves the hands of the halfback, uh, they do it prior to that, it's a free kick. Um, pushing has to be straight and parallel to the ground. So straight towards the opposition goal line. So at the point straight in front of them. Uh, and parallel to the ground. So they're not pushing down, to, they're not moving their body down towards the ground. They're not uh, moving their body up away from the ground. They're pushing parallel to it. And that's where their weight is moving. So during our scrum, um, the team throwing in actually has to strike for the ball. Um, so it does say the hooker has to strike for the ball. However, any front rower can strike for the ball once it touches the ground. So um, it doesn't have to be the hooker that strikes it, but if anyone is, uh, but the hooker does have to strike for the ball if no, if no one else from their team does. Um, so that's, that's why that law is in place there, uh, even though it can be misinterpreted that only the hooker can strike for the ball from the feeding team, um, which, is, which is incorrect. It's just in there to ensure that the feeding team does actually strike for the ball and doesn't the ball doesn't just sit there in the middle with a big power battle pushing waiting for the waiting for the uh um, and to get enough leverage to strike for the ball um and you can't intentionally kick the ball out where it came from so if a front row is doing that be free kick him if they do it again and again then chances are that they're repeatedly doing it of course that that shifts to a penalty instead of a free kick um once the ball's in there, so it can only be played with the legs or the feet. And so the lower part of the sorry, the lower part of the legs or the feet, uh, it can't be lifted up. So either with hands or with feet. Um, and front row players can't use both feet at the same time to, to play the ball. Um, in which case they're not supporting their weight. They're um, again not that there's there's no way that they would be uh, able. To, yeah, it's, it's an illegal act that focuses on safety if they are using both feet to play the ball at the same time that would require that require them hinging or levering off uh, a um swinging off another off another player of these so if the ball's available and the scrum's stationary for three to five seconds the referee will say use it the ball must be played immediately um so again immediately is is within a couple of seconds um Referee, uh, uh, halfback or whoever's playing the ball at the back uh, can't unduly delay um, playing that ball once the referee calls use it. Uh, the sanction for that is a scrum for the opposition at the at the original mark because not not where the ball is um, because the sanction was a scrum sanction for that scrum. 
let's just have a look at what's happened here. Again, you may not have audio, um, but I can describe what's happening. I no, actually don't need audio for this. Oh, so I'll talk us through it. There we go. Bind. Uh, so at this point, um, we have a legal setup. That's where we have a legal setup, which is fine. Uh, here we go. This so with the set call. So at this point, we can see uh, we've got red. It is red on the right hand side. Um, you can start to see if you look underneath. A head starting to pop down. So we can see the head of one of their front row players starting to lower. On this side, we can see the binding is still, it, the binding was started to set up on the side, but now it's starting to drop down further. Where it's a point where it's actually almost pulling down. That's not the key issue. We can see that head in the middle of the scrum, we believe, getting lower and lower. So already we've got a head below, head below hips. Ball's not even fed yet, and already we can see the player on this side. Um, their, their spine is pointing across field, almost towards the referee. So they are pushing inwards uh, on a diagonal rather than towards the opposition goal line. And then what that causes to do is that causes them to to fold down and collapse the scrum. So actions of the front row players are head below hips. So this. And that, if it was just that, you could get them on a free. You can get them on a free kick. Um, but then we have more serious infringements to not pushing square. So that loose head, uh, angling in, and then low binding was probably a stretch. But um, particularly that, uh, yeah, we have a penalty penalty uh, sanction for for that. Just as a bit of context, the penalty call came through from an, from the AR uh, and it was spot on. Um, and that was uh, a kick that a kick a goal that then afforded uh, Tauranga a victory over. What was it? Oh, sorry, no, it wasn't a kick a goal. Apologies, it was a um, it was a it was a draw, which um, which was a essentially a Tauranga victory. It's a bit of context. Anyway, back to scrums. So looking at offside at the scrum, uh, all, all sanctions that are uh, offsides here are penalties. So we're looking for any non-participants, so the rest of the teams to remain five metres behind the homeowner's foot or the goal line, depending on uh, if they're nice and close to it. And they, can't, they don't have to go back any further than the goal line. Now, that's the homeowner's foot of their, of their scrum. Um, usually it's the number eight feet. And that's even if the scrum moves. So if the scrum is moving upfield and they get pushed back uh, one meter, then the uh, the offside line uh, yeah, shifts back a meter as well. So it always maintains five five meters distance um, from the back from that highmost foot. Again, one to one to watch out for, but to, particularly if there's significant dominance, um, and then the put, the scrum does get pushed back quite far. With the opposition scrum half, uh, the the responsibility is to either they can choose to be on the side of the uh, side of the feeding side of the scrum, uh, standing next to the um, uh, so on their side of the mark, next to the uh, feeding halfback, or they can be back with their non participants, so five meters behind. Uh, that's where they need to remain if that's the, if they choose that second option. Once the scrum started, so they can stay near the scrum, so near again. Uh, that word near is meaning within a meter, so they have to remain close. They can't move away and uh, and far from the scrum. Um, they're going to have both their feet behind the ball, and they can't go in the space between the flanker and the eight. Or if they choose to, they can go behind their own eight's feet. You can see it on the diagram there. They can go behind their own hindmost feet of the scrum, and and they can move anywhere across field. So they don't have to stay near the scrum at that point, so long as they go back first. And then can move across field anywhere they like. They can just go behind those feet there. As uh, all the uh, feeding uh, halfback has to do is just have at least one foot on their side of the ball. So they have to follow the ball back and have at least one foot on their side 
of the ball. Um, resetting a scrum, so there's no infringement again. Uh, we need to reset the scrum at the same mark. Uh, so scrum half through, if the ball comes out either end of the tunnel, uh, if it collapses, it breaks up, um, and there's been no clear infringement. Uh, if it's wheeled past 90 degrees, again, it's 45 degrees and with an hour under, under 19 ZD SLVs. Um, so that's where the middle line is passed beyond a position parallel to the touch line. Again, uh, uh, that, the whistle must be blown at this point because then it's an unfair advantage uh, to, to either, to particularly the, the ball, team who has the ball. Because um, they'll be, uh, but after that point, they'll be closer to the opposition goal line than the opposition will be. So, um, yeah, they can't. They can't happen. And we've got to blow the got to blow the whistle. Uh, or if neither side wins position, although this is now um, it's now almost re redundant uh, in the sense that a uh, team will almost always win position or the ball. Now that these now that um, the feeding team has to strike for the ball. So um, yeah, so that's a very unlikely one now. Um, again, as mentioned before. Uh, if the ball's unintentionally kicked out of the tunnel, if it comes out, but if it's repeatedly kicked out, then it's got to be intentional, treated as intentional, uh, in which case it's a penalty for repeated infringements. Um, so once the scrum's reset, the ball's thrown in by the team that previously threw it in. So that's all for all of those reset scrums. Ending the scrum. So the scrum's over once the ball comes out with the scrum in any direction except the tunnel. So if the ball comes out, of the, out, out through the tunnel, Scrum is not being successfully ended. It must be played again, uh, or a free kick, or penalty, depending on how the ball came out, as we've mentioned previously. Um, so once it reaches the feet of the highmost player, and then is either picked up by that player or the or the team's scrum half. Now, just a bit of, oh, and also if the number eight picks the ball up from the feet of a second row player. So just a bit of clarification on those two. So once, if the ball is actually at the feet of the number eight, and they unbind, so they take their arms, uh, they, they are then unbound from the, um, from the scrum. So they don't have at least one arm across a lock, bound to a lock, and the ball is at their feet, then the ball is out. That's because there is no one uh, the ball, the ball is not within anyone's any one person's bound feet uh, within the scrum. So the ball is then considered to be out of the scrum, and the scrum is over. However, if the number eight unbinds in order to pick up the ball from the feet of a second row player, the ball is not out until they pull that ball clear of the second row player's feet, because the ball is still within the scrum inside the bound player's feet within the scrum. If that makes sense. Uh, referee blows the whistle for an infringement, that's when the scrum ends as well. And, or if the ball reaches the goal line, so if it's on or over the goal line, no matter where it is in the scrum, uh, once, it, once it reaches that goal line, the scrum is finished. So it's in general play, so there can, be, there can be no possible scrum infringements after that time. After that time. Uh, dangerous play in scrum, so all sanctions for this are a penalty. Uh, so this includes um, charging or uh, opposition or pulling an opponent. Um, lifting an opponent off their feet, so actually intentionally doing that action, uh, forcing them upwards with an intentional action, or intentionally collapse, collapsing a scrum. Uh, so that's taking up a position which, or intentionally falling or kneeling as well. So we'll just tee up this one here. Bind! Set! Stay there now. Let's go. Three overextending. Three overextended, no. Feet too far back. So he said three overextending. So again, they've got the three number three's got themselves into a position with their feet too far back, which then means that they couldn't support their their own weight, and then they fell to the ground. So they've because of their actions, they've intentionally fallen on or kneeled or collapsed, the so they've intentionally fell or collapsed the scrum, um, which is a which is dangerous play in the scrum. Restricted play in the scrum, 
Uh, so these following ones are penalties. Uh, so if, if the ball comes out of the scrum and someone falls on it or over the ball, then it's a, it's a penalty. Uh, in the same way that once a ball emerges from a um, ruck or a mall, uh, in, in the same way uh, on the ground, um, then someone falls on it immediately, then it's a penalty too. Uh, if the halfback picks up, kicks the ball while, while it's in the scrum, again, um, half, only, the only players that can play the ball with their feet are the eight bound players for that team, not the halfback. Uh, or if a non-front row player is uh, holding or pushing an opponent. Again, that's where I come back to mentioning those flankers. They should not, if they are bound legally, they shouldn't even be able to reach a, um, an opponent. Um, and either way, even if they could reach them, they're not allowed to touch them anyway. So either by holding or pushing them, uh, that's a penalty too. So other restrictions at a scrum, and these ones are free kicks. So bringing the ball back into the scrum. So if the ball comes out and then it's brought back in by anyone, whether it be a player in the scrum or the halfback, then it's a free kick. Uh, Non-front row players, once that ball's in the tunnel and they play the ball in the tunnel, uh, again, that's a free kick as well. Um, or scrum half, and this is the same as a ruck, the scrum half uh, makes you know, tries to make the opponent believe the ball is out of the scrum. So that, that can include pretending to pick the ball out and run one way, um, which can, and then the, you know, the number eight might then pick up the ball and run the other way. Um, that's a free kick because that's, that's deception and unfair play. Um, also looking through some of our NZR game priorities as well. So what our, uh, ref what our officials are looking for within our community game um, from our referees. And again, this is a bit of a summary of what we have gone through as well. But again, those th three calls and three actions, crouch, blind and set. Uh, looking for stability and balance between each call, uh, as we previously mentioned. That is a priority for our referees. A uh, small gap must be maintained between the front rows on the call of bind. So again, that's, that puts the onus completely on each team supporting their weight uh, and not leaning or resting their heads on the shoulders or the opposition. Um, and again, no head, on, oh, no head on shoulder protect the hookers. So the hooker will need a trigger leg in, uh, in, in saying that. Um, the, oh, sorry, and no backfire fully loading, pushing through onto the front rows. So again, we're looking for teams to balance, completely balance their scrum. Um, that's everyone, not just the front row, not just the front rows being balanced, but everyone in the scrum being balanced as well. So that's where the communication between front rows and and tight and uh, in their in their back rowers uh, and locks need to need to be really clear and that's where as ref referees can facilitate that um just say look if you if you're feeling weight from behind um or if that's you know that's coming through early you need to have a chat and then halfbacks are required to put the ball straight without delay so part of that ball has to land on the middle line um again uh they um they it has to be straight as well so as mentioned previously they can't end up on the opposition side of the scrum and feed the ball back way back on an angle through the scrum because they still have to feed it straight. So it's going to be straight. And by, if they are feeding it straight, no matter where they're lined up, that ball is going to land on the middle line by default anyway. That ball's got to be hooked. Um, I think we've moved away pretty well from that uh, stalemate we used to have. DSLVs, and I've just copied and pasted directly from the DSLVs for this one purely because um, they can be slightly not misinterpreted. I think that people understand what they're about. However, just the wording, the way that they actually are phrased in the DSLVs uh, can be slightly confusing and require a reread. So it's got a title under, under the Scrum section in DSLVs that say this is applicable to all levels of domestic rugby under 13 and below. However, that only applies to Law 30 here. Then once, then the rest of the restrictions apply to everything under 19 and below. So um, we have a maximum one and a half meter push for under 19s. And again, that drops down uh, further once you get um, to under 13s, uh, et cetera. Um, ball must be released from the scrum at any DSLV level, uh, age grade level, then the, it can't be held at the back of the scrum. It, once it's controlled at the back of the scrum, it must be used. Uh, and then no intentional wheeling of a scrum. So whereas uh, we have the allowance within a um, 
a senior games for once once the team moves forward then then if the if there's extra strength on one side then if uh if the it goes around then that's okay uh however there at a dsw level no no team at any point can intentionally wheel a scrum so that's a free kick if that happens and again the limit is 45 degrees instead of 90 um and the referee must stop play at this point this is where i was speaking about earlier uh then the referee orders this another scrum at the place where the scrum is stopped so that is the exception to the rule um and this is the way it is <laughs> So yeah, just be just be mindful of that uh, in a uh, DSLV level game. That if you have a reset scrum for angle, uh, so for uh, past forty five degrees, you reset it where the scrum stopped. Cool. All right. Um, questions, comments, concerns, clarifications. No, we're good. No, you're good, Michael. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm all good here. <laughs> yeah. No. Nah, cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, a bit of a meaty one today, of course. Um, it's quite it's quite nice to uh, get it talk, even talk myself through a lot of this sometimes. It's amazing how much I'm, you know, just sort of re-engaging with a lot of the laws just by just by actively going through it, even though it's like, yeah, I know this, I know this, I know this. But then you go and read it again or read it out loud and actually then start to talk about it. You're like, oh yeah, that's actually what that means. And, you know, it just sort of reaffirms things in your mind. So that's been, that's been pretty cool. 